Okay, so you may be asking yourselves, where is the better half of the Wednesday discussion crew? And I'm uh, fortunately for her, but unfortunately for us, um, uh, uh, Charmaine is on vacation this week. So you guys are stuck with just me again, but we will, I promise, make it a rich and interesting and at the very least entertaining discussion today. Um, but I'm super excited to get to be back here to facilitate um, uh, and learn and think through a case with everybody. Um, we have some exciting introductions to do today, but before we do that, I'm going to put a plug out to see if anybody has a case that they want to present this morning. Feel free to just type your name in the chat if you have a case that you want to present. Um, and if you need a few minutes to sort of mull through your case logs or think, oh man, was that a good case that I saw a few days ago? Um, fear not, you have a couple minutes because I'm very excited to introduce you all to um, uh, somebody who will be scribing for us this morning and is also one of our newest CP Solvers team members, um, Amanda. Amanda, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, everyone. I am Amanda. I'm from Brazil. And today it's my first day as a CP Solvers team member. And I am so, so happy and excited to be part of this team. And I am do they scribe today i hope you enjoy and i will do my best thank you ah, i just love it so many good lessons already in there enthusiasm excitement and just say we're gonna that i think what 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 you close there with is what's going to be the theme of our our session today we're just going to all try our best and see how close we can get to the final diagnosis here amanda super excited that you're that you're finally formally in the team member role. This is awesome. Getting a lot of love in the chat too. All right. Well, I would do a going once, going twice for a case, not just a random going once, going twice. But if anybody has a case, feel free to um, volunteer. All right. That is a okay. Um, Madalena is here to the rescue to bring us a human DX case this morning. Um, and so uh, we will go ahead and take it away and get started. As always, please feel free to uh, share your thinking and your thoughts in the chat. Um, since I'm not in my car this morning, like I was on Sunday for student VMR, it'll be much easier for me to sort of take a look at the chat. And so I may call on you to ask you to share your thinking and share some teaching points for those who watch the video later. Um, if you're not in a place where you can unmute and share your thinking, that's totally fine. You can always um, uh, you can always just let me know if I come to call on you. But the more the more voices we get represented here today, the better. Um, and so uh, I will let Madalena take us away with the first Aliqua here. All right. So I will jump into this human DX case. So this is a case of a 47 year old man who is presenting with chest pain. So just to give you um, some information about the care setting. So this is kind of a routine visit in a clinic and some information about the chest pain. So the location is substernal. The quality is aching and dull. And the chest pain is associated with, um, it says here that it worsens with minimal exertion and is relieved by rest. In terms of the tempo, the chest pain has been insidiously progressive over the past two months, now provoked by minimal activity. And um, the chest pain is, in terms of kind of the evolution of it, it's markedly worse with a, it's kind of gotten progressively worse over the past week with a left-sided um, pleuritic character. And I will pause there. All right. This is a very, very fun, fun place to start. Madeline, just to clarify the age, um, yeah. is it 97 or 47? 47. 47. 47. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, I will say we are starting with a very common chief concern, but at least for me, maybe in, in a less common clinical setting, um, given that this is somebody who's coming into primary care clinic. I practice um, both in the emergency room and on the inpatient service. Um, and so very frequently we'll find, we'll find myself encountering patients who have chest pain. And while sometimes we talk about how um, uh, the, the, 
DDX is going to shift and evolve depending on the site of care we're at. There are some chief concerns that carry such morbid possible diagnoses with them that we, no matter, no matter where we are, whether we're on the street, in the primary care clinic, in the hospital, right, we're going to still work through our classic over or um, uh, sort of our classic schema for that clinical presentation. And I think chest pain, shortness of breath, these are two of those very, very, um, very, very morbid chief concerns that somebody may have. And so we'll sort of rely on our classic four plus two plus two schema for, our, for chest pain from the CV solvers. Again, four cardiac causes that we're going to think about. That includes two A's and two T's, right? Acute coronary syndrome, aortic dissection, Takotsugo's cardiomyopathy, and tamponade as the four morbid cardiac causes. And then the plus two plus two is two very life-threatening pulmonary causes, as well as two life-threatening esophageal causes. The two pulmonary causes are going to be PE and pneumothorax. And then the two esophageal causes are going to be esophageal rupture and an esophageal impaction, where basically food is stuck in the esophagus. And that can also end up leading to a rupture developing. But, right, reasoning is not a process where we just list diagnoses, right? Reasoning is a process where we prioritize and weigh the different probabilities of the diagnoses that we have. So we say, okay, we have this four plus two plus two schema. How do we reason or at least prioritize the probabilities here? And I'm going to open it up to the group and say, what are the features of this case that are jumping out to you that help us prioritize or rank the most likely causes of this individual's chest pain using that framework that we have of the sort of morbid causes of chest pain. Are there any sort of um, associated symptoms alongside the chest pain that are helping you weigh whether this is a cardiac cause, a pulmonary cause, or an esophageal cause? That's all right. I will share a couple potential things that that may be helping us here. I will say the two most is so. Oh, awesome, awesome, Al Al Alexander. Yeah, Alexander, are you in a place where you can unmute and share a little bit more about what you put in the chat here about the exertional component? No worries at all. No worries at all. I will just elevate what you just said and say that the exertional component is very, very helpful here, right? We oftentimes think about exertional chest pain as prioritizing a potential underlying cardiac cause. Certainly, there's many underlying pathologies that can worsen with exertion, right? A pulmonary disease may lead to worsening shortness of breath with exertion, right? But the fact that we're having exertional chest pain suggests that there is probably a problem with the epicardial coronary artery vessels, where when one exerts themselves and there's increased myocardial demand, the muscle of the heart may not get the blood flow it needs, and so we will experience an ache. Not only is this exertional chest pain, but the amount of exertion that's required to initiate pain is shrinking, right? So we're seeing also a progression of these underlying problems here, right? So that for me is going to prioritize asking ourselves, are we dealing with an acute coronary syndrome, whether that's STEMI, and STEMI, or potentially unstable angina, which seems like it could fit with this illness script here, or um, is there an alternative cardiac cause? There's one piece of this that doesn't classically fit with my illness script for sort of progressive coronary artery disease, which is the pleuritic component to it, right? If we pull up our schema here for pleuritic chest pain, just give me one second. I'm going to bring up the CP solver schema for pleuritic chest pain here. Right, we can see that there's actually a lot of things on that list that don't necessarily map on to ischemic coronary artery disease. Right, pleurisy really comes down to thinking about what are the things that the lung touches when we take a breath in, right? And so the clauses of pleuritic chest pain may include chest wall diseases like the pleura, the muscle, the bones, or the cartilage, right? There's also mediastinal processes and the abdomen. And so if we say that, this, that there is exertional chest pain, which really puts us in the area of the cardiac structures, and there's a pleuritic component, where that helps us to start to organize or at least prioritize our thinking is within the mediastina, right? So we may be dealing with a coronary process causing exertional chest pain, but the pleuritic component makes me wonder, is there also some associated inflammatory process around the heart and the pericardium itself? Pericarditis could do this. 
An inflammatory pericardial effusion could do this as well. And then we also see some rare things here like aortic dissection. And so I think the center of gravity of this case, even just with the history, is putting us around the, the, um, the mediastinum and, and specifically the heart. But we're going to have to reconcile is, is this primary is this primarily a pump or a pipe problem, right? Where the pipes are getting clogged or is there also a surrounding structures problem here where the pericardium is potentially inflamed? Certainly things like the pleura um, and, and, and uh, the lungs are certainly not off the hook here. But again, I think as we look, we're gonna prioritize thinking through the cardiac structures in the pericardium just based off of this overlap of exertional chest pain and the, pleur and the pleurisy that we see. All right, Madalena, I'll kick it back to you. All right, fantastic. So um, to give you a little bit more information, uh, the patient has no pertinent past medical history. Uh, the patient takes no medications. Um, we also do not know any information about family history. Uh, in terms of social history, this patient was born in Mexico and immigrated to the United States 30 years ago. Uh, in terms of health-related behaviors and substance use history, uh, the patient is a social drinker, social drinker, never smoker, and no illicit drug drug use. Um, so I'll give you the vitals in the physical exam. So for the vitals, the temperature was ninety-seven point three degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure one ten over sixty-three, heart rate ninety-four respiratory rate 12, and the patient was sat in 100% on room air. In terms of the physical exam, the information that I have is that the cardiac exam was actually unremarkable. And in terms of the abdominal exam, there was epigastric and left upper quadrant tenderness to palpation. Uh, there was no abdominal rebound or guarding. The pulmonary exam was also unremarkable. Uh, there is noted here that there is bilateral lower extremity swelling, but no pitting edema, erythema, or tenderness to palpation. And I will pause there. All right. Well, this, is, um, this case is only getting more and more interesting here. Right. Just to recap where we were coming into this aliquot of information, we were saying there's chest pain, there's pleurisy, there's exertional progression of the chest pain. So we were prioritizing, again, the heart and the mediastinal processes, right? That could include coronary artery disease or potentially a pericardial process or a vascular process, like something that involves the aorta that could be causing chest pain and a pleuritic component. But we have to now looking at the past medical history, the family history, the health related behaviors, right? We have to reconcile one really glaring tension here, which is that many of the diseases that I mentioned that are associated with coronary or um, uh, many of the acute coronary syndromes or the non-acute coronary syndromes like angina, right? Are usually not seen in somebody who's 47 years old. Now they can be seen in someone who's 47 years old if there's a big enough history in terms of familial risk factors and behavioral risk factors and other medical comorbidities, right? Oftentimes we would not expect to see a, uh, a symptomatic coronary artery disease in a 47 year old, but if there's a strong family history of hyperlipidemia, if there's other modifiable risk factors such as high cholesterol, tobacco use, alcohol use, um, uh, uh, or um, metabolic syndrome, right? We might say, okay, this individual's risk of coronary artery disease could be high enough even at a younger age. But we don't necessarily see those things here, right? We don't see a significant history of hypertension. We don't see underlying other diseases associated with metabolic syndrome, things like diabetes or high cholesterol social, um, uh, uh, maybe a small amount of alcohol use, but not enough to drastically increase this individual's risk. And we see that he's a non-smoker with, no, with um, at least at this point, no known family history of significant cardiac disease. So what that does for me is, right, if, if we were saying that coronary artery disease seems like it's something that we have to, is quite probable here given the symptomatic character and then the other stuff is down here, this background starts to bring these two more um, closer together in terms of the probability. Certainly, we're still going to explore the coronary artery disease hypothesis based off of the past medical history, right? But it's not necessarily this bright shining light in the ways that it was with just the first aliquot of information. 
Then we come to the exam and we say, well, what does the exam further do to shift our thinking? And what this exam does for me is it pulls my mind back out of the mediastinum and makes me think about other potential things that could cause chest pain with a, with a pleuritic component as well. If you all entertain me for just another second here, I'm gonna pull back up our pleuritic chest pain schema. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it up to the group and say, what features of the exam, and particularly this epigastric pain, what, what do those, are um, the epigastric pain and the left upper quadrant tenderness, what do those bring into the fold here for you all from our schema here for, for pleuritic chest pain? Are there any things on here that could cause left upper quadrant tenderness to palpation? Things that we may see in the abdominal compartment, for example. Liver disease, Marcella, I love it. And then on the other side of the body, right? On the left side, the spleen, right? So Alexander, again, mentioning the spleen. Yep, awesome, awesome. Um, let's see. Um, maybe, um, uh, Aya, are you in a place to unmute and share a little bit more about what you put in there? It's totally okay if you're not. Um, I, yeah, I can share a bit. Um, I was just thinking, you know, we're saying like left upper quadrant. I was thinking about the spleen. I know the fact that he doesn't have fevers may argue against having like an abscess. He's not like acutely sick, but, um, you know, splenic abscess was something I was thinking about. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I think it's a phenomenal point, right? Again, what this exam does is it pulls our brain out of the mediastinum and makes us sort of, um, uh, makes us really pay um, important attention to what I think is the forgotten quadrant of the abdomen, which is the left upper quadrant, right? The spleen is certainly one of, one of the organs there, in addition to potentially the kidneys, although that would usually cause more of a posterior pain because they're retroperitoneal organs, as well as the splenic flexure of the colon and the intestines, right? But now we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we link an exertional component to these symptoms to this possible pleuritic component, right? And if we think about what happens when, when we exert ourselves, we put increased demand on the heart and the heart then ends up pumping more blood and we pump blood through our vessels into, into um, uh, uh, into the sort of um, uh, organs throughout the rest of the body. And so the way that we could think about potentially this overlap of an exertional component, right, and the pleuritic component is to say, well, gosh, is there not only a problem in the spleen or in an organ in the left upper quadrant, but is there also a problem with the vessels that end up perfusing those components, right? Vascular disease plus an inflammatory process within the left upper quadrant could be one way that we could start to link these presenting symptoms of exertional pain and pleuritic pain together. Again, we'll have to see how the rest of the case unfolds, but that's one way that I'm connecting what are oftentimes separate pain components, exertional and pleuritic into one single presentation here, right? So the heart certainly on the hook, the pericardium certainly still on the hook, but now we're bringing in the left upper quadrant here and particularly the spleen and wondering how do we link those two together? And a vascular process is one way that we could do it, whether it's a vasculopathy or an inflammatory vasculitis here. All right, fantastic discussion. I'm learning so much about pleuritic chest pain. Uh, so to give you some initial labs, so a BNP was sent, which was normal. A troponin was also normal. In terms of the CBC, the white blood cell count was 12,900, 77% neutrophils. A hemoglobin was 3.4. A hematocrit was 13.7%. MCV, 58. Platelets, 287,000. And a smear was sent, which showed poikilocytosis, anisocytosis, and microcytosis. Uh, and then the next L call we have is imaging, but I'll, I'll pause here. And yeah, the hemoglobin was 3.4, Alex, yeah.
And Madeline, did you say that the MCB was 57? Uh, MCB 58. 58, okay, all right. Yep. All right, so now we have, what I think is, is a very, very interesting curveball here, which is that we have this profound, profound anemia and a profound microcytic anemia. There are essentially three ways that we can think about severe or um, uh, three mechanisms by which somebody can develop severe anemia. The first and oftentimes the most common is blood loss anemia, right? Whether, and usually that is um, acutely or chronically, those are both oftentimes through gastrointestinal blood loss. The second is a hemolytic process. And then the third is going to be bone marrow failure. One of the things that is usually the most helpful when we think about the evaluation of someone's anemia is to think about what the time course of their anemia is. Acute anemias, right? Again, most often are gonna be related to underlying blood loss anemia, right? Like for example, a GI bleed. Hemolysis can also be in there. And then we can occasionally have acute bone marrow related processes from bone marrow failure. For example, leukemias can do that. When we move from the acute to chronic, the prioritization shifts a little bit where we oftentimes see bone marrow related processes, usually at the top of us. For example, iron deficiency anemia deprives the bone marrow of the underlying substrate or of one of the substrates necessary to produce red, red blood cells. The caveat here is that uh, usually still blood loss is a major part of chronic anemias. For example, iron deficiency anemia usually being from a cold GI blood loss. So if we think about an acute anemia, we're gonna prioritize GI or GI blood loss, usually look to hemolysis, and then also think about whether or not there's a bone marrow failure process. We flip that prioritization when the anemia is chronic. Again, usually things like nutritional de deficiencies or other things that could suppress the bone marrow function are gonna be a part of a chronic anemia. Then we'll think about blood loss and then chronic hemolysis is a pretty rare phenomenon. What we don't know here is whether this is acute or whether this is chronic, right? And the severity of the anemia means we're gonna to have to look at, at understanding whether or not each of these three mechanisms is on the hook. Right? We're going to ask the patient now about if there have been symptoms that suggest underlying GI blood loss, whether that's melana or hematochesia. We're going to perform the initial lab test to look for underlying hemolysis. Right? We're going to look and see, is there elevated total bilirubin and indirect bilirubin? Is the LDH level high? Is the haptoglobin low? But one of the things that's missing on this individual's exam that would suggest underlying hemolysis is the finding of jaundice, right? We don't see sclerolicterus and we don't see jaundice skin. And it's pretty tough for someone to hemolyze themselves down to a hemoglobin of 3.4. So that seems less likely here. The bone marrow, I think, becomes certainly on the hook because we have this finding of left upper quadrant pathology. There are a number of disease processes that can span the bone marrow and the lymphoproliferative system that can cause an under or that can cause a severe anemia like this, right? For example, individuals can have underlying lymphomas or leukemias that lead to splenomegaly and bone marrow failure, right? The other kicker here though, is that again, sometimes we can see the spleen start to enlarge in the setting of acute underlying hemolysis. So we can see how all three of these potential mechanisms are on the hook here, right? Now, if we go back to the initial presenting symptom and be like, well, what do we make of the exertional chest pain now? I'm feeling much more reassured as that, that we have a good explanation for this individual's exertional chest pain. There is so little oxygen in his bloodstream because his hemoglobin is so low. So certainly a severe anemia can unmask somebody's, somebody's exertional chest pain and exertional shortness of breath. And so at this point now that that symptom is seemingly explained, I'm really focusing here now on the underlying cause of this anemia and how it relates to that left upper quadrant pain. And I think we see the spleen occupying a larger and larger space here, right? So what we're gonna wanna understand is, is the spleen enlarged, right? We wanna get a better understanding and also of what potentially is happening in the bone marrow. So if that hemolytic evaluation is unrevealing and there's no signs of a GI bleed, we're gonna potentially focus our efforts in thinking about causes of underlying bone marrow failure. I won't go into that schema yet in the interest of time, but again, the overlap of the spleen and the bone marrow, I think is where the center of gravity of this case is now with the chest pain being explained by the severe anemia.
All right. So um, the next information I have in this case is a CT scan of the chest and abdomen with contrast. So I'm actually going to share my screen to show this to you all. Okay, can you guys see this? Are you able to see my screen? Awesome. So I've, um, there were four images here. So um, I will just kind of, you know, give a little time for each slide so you all can, can see. So this is the first one. Second one. So those are all of the images I have of the CT scan. Um, let me know if you would like me to go back to any of them to take a look. No, I think um, I'm very interested to hear the read. I have some sense of what could be going on here, but uh, never send an internist to do a radiologist job. So <laughs> I'm really, I'm really excited to get to hear what the actual formal, formal read here is. Yes, yeah, so I actually don't give you the read of the CT scan. They just say that there's multiple abnormalities here, but um, in the description of the case resolution, it shows what um, an EGD, the findings of the EGD. Would you like me to give that to you? Um, actually, no, that's okay. So what, what, why don't I, I'll take um, a closer look and just sort of think through what I'm potentially seeing here then. Sure, I can go back to the first one. And yeah. Check. So my, my sense here is that the structure that we're seeing is, uh, it seems like what we're looking at is the stomach, is that, um, uh, and it looks like what we're seeing is sort of really, really thickened lining of the stomach itself. And, yeah. and so then if we ask ourselves, okay, well, what, so like really, really thickened lining of the stomach, in addition to this finding, if we go down a little bit further down to the chest, Right. It looks like there's potentially also something that they're noting in the lung as well, whether that's a sort of a nodular structure um, or potentially a PE that we see in um, uh, in the lung. My guess is that that's a thrombus based on the fact that it's the CT with contrast there. So we're seeing a potentially a PE there in the chest um, and then this very, very thickened, thickened stomach stomach lining here as well. So I will say this is very, very humbling. And again, it really highlights how difficult it can be to understand what the underlying cause of abdominal pain is without a CT scan, right? Because the organs all overlap over themselves so much. Um, uh, and so it can be difficult to say based on, on our exam, unless there's, for example, overt splenomegaly, right? The stomach also sits right there next to where the spleen is in the left upper quadrant, right? And so again, the CT scan helps us do um, helps us much more than, than, than the exam only did in localizing the site of pathology. The other thing that this does here for us now is it tells us, right, that we need to better understand what is happening in the stomach. And it gives us an increased understanding that potentially the cause of this individual's anemia is actually not the spleen bone marrow overlap, but actually is what we said probabilistically is the most likely cause, uh, right? Something related to underlying GI blood loss, right? And so what now I feel like where where we can say that we are that we are at here is that there is something very abnormal happening in the stomach, right? There is a there is a very interesting DDX for sort of sort of thickened thickened gastric folds that I won't necessarily take us into right now because I want to confirm that on the on the EGD, but we're able to sort of piece together the chain of reasoning more and more for this case, right? Under whatever is the process is happening in the stomach could certainly set us up for underlying GI blood loss. That GI blood loss could lead to the development of a severe anemia. That severe anemia could lead to ex exertional chest pain, right? And then the pleuritic component now, right? We potentially have the link of, oh, is there actually a pulmonary embolism that could have been driving this individual's left-sided pleurisy as well, right? 
thickened abnormalities within the stomach plus a pulmonary embolism certainly makes us think about the possibility of a, of a gastric cancer that leads to a hyper a hypercoagulable state. So that's one way to potentially link these link these findings together. Um, but again, right, this is going to be most helpful to understand based off of the EGD, where we can confirm this hypothesis of, oh, are these actually really, really thick in gastric folds, which again has a DDX that we may potentially get to think through. But just from our type one thinking, right, we can say thickening of the stomach plus a PE can certainly lead to the findings of anemia, exertional chest pain, and pleuritic chest pain here as well. And again, a gastric cancer is one way to link those together. But I'll turn it back over to you, Madalena, tell us what the, what the EGD shows, and then maybe we can pause one more time before the final diagnosis. Yeah, so perfect. So the information I have here is that, as you said, the iron studies were consistent with iron deficiency anemia. So when EGD was done, which showed a large friable mass in the gastric fundus, um, and a biopsy was performed, which would reveal the, the final diagnosis. So I can, I can pause here if you want to comment on that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that is very helpful about this EGD, right, is that we see that rather than, than there just being very, very thick and gastric folds, there's actually a single isolated focal mass within within. Um, within the stomach, right? That sort of um, uh, DDX for the large gastric folds, it includes things like Menetrier's disease, Zollinger, Ellison syndrome, gastric cancer, and things like that. But we're going to shift our DDX and say, okay, there is a underlying large mass here within the stomach, right? And I want to share with you all just a basic framework that you can use when there is a mass anywhere in the body, right? If you see a mass somewhere in the body, there is a basic framework that we can use, right? There are benign causes of masses, and these are usually words that have funky Latin roots at the beginning and then oma at the end, right? Somebody can have a craniopharyngioma if they have a mass up here, right? We may have a lipoma somewhere in the body, right? But again, these sort of words that have a funny Latin root plus oma at the end, these are usually gonna be what we think of as benign masses, right? So benign is one category of the mass. We can also have malignant causes of masses, right? Which is again, our sort of cancer framework. We can have infectious causes of masses, right? There are many, many organisms or many infections that can cause underlying mass forming structures or sorry, mass forming infections. We can have also autoimmune or non-infectious inflammatory causes of masses, right? For example, granulomatosis with polyangiitis is one example of a mass forming autoimmune condition. Sarcoidosis is another auto-inflammatory condition that can cause underlying masses, right? And so while we usually, when we think mass or when we see a mass, we think cancer, right? The DDX is actually much larger than that. Again, benign, malignant, infectious and autoimmune. And I think in this 47 year old individual, all of those are potentially on the DDX here, right? We are now, we're never gonna settle on a benign cause of a mass in somebody with this severe of a clinical presentation until we rule out the other three. So let's talk through some things that could be a malignant, infectious, or auto-inflammatory cause of a mass here, right? There are, are a number of different cancers that we can end up finding within the stomach, right? The most common is gonna be gastric adenocarcinoma is one that we can see, but you can also see, um, for example, neuroendocrine tumors that make their way into the stomach, um, uh, as well as metastatic disease that can make their way into the stomach as well. But if we just say probabilistically, what is the thing that is going to lead to a, um, a underlying gastric mass, right? Adenocarcinoma is the one that we may think about the most, um, at least the most often. What about some auto-inflammatory conditions that can end up causing masses in the stomach, right? There are, um, uh, I would say those are usually going to be much less common, right? But example, for example, sarcoid can go anywhere in the body and could potentially cause masses. And again, we said a vascular disease process is one potential underlying link here. Um, uh, uh, but again, we don't necessarily see syndromes of a vasculitis elsewhere in this individual. So while I said GPA, could be a mass forming auto-inflammatory disease. It seems very incompatible with this individual's presentation because we don't necessarily see, um, it's pretty rare to see localized gastric GPA, the one vasculitis that can preferentially affect the visceral organs of the abdomen is gonna be something like polyarteritis nodosa. But again, we don't see the characteristic sort of um, uh, uh, 
uh, out pouchings within the vasculature in the stomach here, right? Now we come to the very fun world of infections, right? And there are a number of possible mass forming infections that we can have here. Whenever I see indolent infection plus a mass, right? We are gonna think about tuberculosis. And when we think about tuberculosis, we wanna think about the things that can look like tuberculosis, which are usually endemic fungal infections, coccidiotomycosis, histo, blasto, and then in somebody who has moved to the United States from Central America, we might also think about something that can look a little bit like TB and coxy, which is paracoxy as well. So if we take that framework, again, benign, malignant, infectious, autoimmune, right, we're going to rule out benign for now because that's a diagnosis of exclusion, and we said autoimmune, autoinflammatory is less likely. And so now we have this tension that exists between cancers and underlying infectious processes, right? This is a 47-year-old uh, uh, 47 year old man who, um, uh, by all intents and purposes, does not carry a significant amount of risk factors for the development of underlying cancer anywhere in the body, but particularly gastric or, uh, but particularly gastric cancer. We don't see heavy tobacco use, and we don't see a history of heavy alcohol use. We don't see certain risk factors that we might also associate with it, like a, like a familial history. So I think right cancer is certainly possible, but it's not necessarily a glaring bright light here. So now we can turn our attention to thinking about infections as well, right? Is something like tuberculosis or an underlying endemic fungal infection possible? Absolutely. This individual used previously used to live in an area in which TB and some of these other endemic fungal infections are endemic. Right? Somebody who lives um, uh, where I do on the West Coast in the Bay Area, who spends time in the Central Valley, they may be at risk for something like Coxy. Somebody who previously used to live in Mexico um, uh, may be at risk for acquiring tu tuberculosis, histoplasmosis, or paracoxy as some of these potential underlying mass forming infections. There's two other mass forming infections that I want you all to keep on speed dial in your brain. And those are gonna be actinomycosis as well as nocardia. These are other infections that can sometimes look like TB. Which of these is the most likely diagnosis here? I can't pretend to really frame these beyond what epidemiology would say is most likely. And I think epidemiologically we would say TB is probably the most probable here just based off of, its, off of how prevalent it is throughout the world. But again, all of those infections that we mentioned are also on the hook, right? If I were seeing this patient myself, right, I would, we would never be in a situation where we would have to say which one do we think it is because the biopsy is going to tell us. But from a reasoning perspective, I will sort of share my thinking here in terms of how I'm prioritizing this. Given that there's no significant risk factors for underlying cancer, but a more prominent risk factor for one of these potentially acquired infections, my mind is going more towards infections being most likely, but they're really close in terms of, in, in terms of the underlying probability here. But again, the absence of risk factors and the younger age combined with the risk factors for infection makes me think that something like TB or one of these other mass forming infections is, um, uh, uh, seems to be probable here. And again, TB can be quite pro-inflammatory as well. So we could see the development of a blood clot in the setting of, of any of these underlying indolent infectious processes as well. All right, that was truly just a masterclass of gastric masses, <laughs> really phenomenal. Um, okay, so the biopsy returned, which showed um, gastric adenocarcinoma. That's what was found on biopsy. And it says here that the patient was also found to have multiple small pulmonary emboli that may have been contributing to his pain as well. Um, they give like a few teaching points here that I can yeah. summarize quickly, but um, did you, just any reactions, Jack, or should I just jump into that? I think um, I will just share a couple, maybe two very brief reflections here, um, which is again, how um, it is so much more important for us to be able to, um, like it is fun to be able to say that we know the exact diagnosis, but be able to hold the competing diagnoses in our minds at the same time, I think is a skill that personally I'm trying much more to focus on. And I think as I reflect on this case where I'm gonna be focusing my efforts is to say, okay, what are the potential 
risk factors or red flags for cancer that I may have not appreciated in looking through this case prospectively. Because again, we find that from that the ultimate final diagnosis is gastric adenocarcinoma here. And for me, I was leaning more towards infection. So from a cognitive autopsy perspective, I'm going to be thinking, okay, well, what are the potential risk factors that I may have underappreciated that led me to underweight the probability of cancer here relative to underlying infection? And then the other thing is just how humbling the reasoning process is, right? We started out thinking, could this be acute coronary syndrome? And we end up with a really devastating and sinister diagnosis of underlying gastric, gastric adenocarcinoma. Um, and I think that that really highlights two things, which is one, um, how there can be such variability and such overlap in the way that, in the way that, that, um, that diseases present. And that again, while being able to weigh what the probabilities are, it's also about knowing what the next steps are, right? Because we thought a lot together about what the exam might tell us, but then the CT scan gave us much more clarity on that, right? We had some hypotheses of what could be the underlying cause of this individual's anemia, right? But it wasn't until we got the imaging that we were really able to link together chronic blood loss anemia as the underlying cause here. And even with the CT scan, what the CT scan showed didn't have enhanced clarity until we saw the EGD. So I would encourage everybody as we think through thinking through the diagnostic schemas here, also think through your management schemas and your management scripts of like, when, when, when do I want to get the EGD or under what circumstances? What are the things that may have made the CT scan the right test to get here so that we can understand where our testing thresholds are for these diagnoses as we also think through our schemas for the, when we weigh these diagnoses against one another. But I'll turn it back over to you, Madalena. All right, great. So I will just read through some of the kind of the three teaching points they, they have here. So the first one is actually on epidemiology. So they say that first generation immigrants from regions with high prevalence of gastric cancer, namely South America and Asia, uh, remain at elevated risk. So as in this patient. And the risk in subsequent generations declines towards a lower baseline, suggesting that early environmental exposures have greater influence on incidence than genetics. Uh, and then the next two pearls that they give are related to the clinical presentation. So the first is that it's, it is not uncommon for patients with advanced gastric cancer to entirely lack abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, or weight loss as symptoms. That kind of points to what you were saying, Jack, like there weren't really obvious signs of um, kind of pointing to cancer. And uh, patients can instead present solely with occult GI bleeding with symptoms of invasion into local structures or with deep or superficial venous thrombosis as seen in this case. And then the last thing that's mentioned here is that while uh, deep venous thrombosis of the leg classically causes unilateral painful pitting edema, leg swelling without avert edema, tenderness or pain is not an uncommon presentation. Bilateral leg DVTs are also unusual, but not rare, particularly in the context of systemic thrombo thrombophilia, such as is seen in nephrotic syndrome or the hypercoagulability of malignancy. So those are the teaching points that they have here, but um, really just a, a phenomenal discussion of this case. Thanks so much, Madeline. I really appreciate you bringing this case. This was a, uh, really educational for me. And I think before turning it over to Sammy, I know we're a little bit over time, but there's too much good stuff here. Um, I think one thing that I just want to reflect on personally is the ways in which my own illness scripts for, for this case, in terms of thinking about illness scripts for underlying infections like TB relative to illness scripts for, uh, for cancer in a young individual, um, included some bias in this case, right? We are oftentimes taught a lot about risk factors for acquiring tuberculosis, right? But I will say I, um, uh, it is very new information to me that, to know that, um, that individuals who may immigrate from South and Central America are at an increased risk for gastric cancer. Um, there are other countries that were in my list of increased risks of gastric cancer, right? But I think it is very telling and very humbling that um, uh, that this, um, at least for individuals from South and Central America who moved to the United States, um, uh, uh, these, this is a, I would say, within the U.S. healthcare system, a marginalized and oppressed community within the U.S. healthcare system. And I think the fact that my own illness scripts don't necessarily tend to the risk for these treatable diseases um, like underlying gastric cancers um, uh, speaks to the ways in which our illness scripts have the potential to perpetuate bias, but also to overcome it when we can really check the assumptions that we may be having here. And so I think this case highlights that, that for me, um, in terms of revising some of these illness scripts, there is also some potential um, uh, 
uh, structural stigma to unwind here, where our brains may go to the acquired infections, but not think about um, think about other other disease that 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 these populations may be at increased risk for, like underlying gastric cancer. So um, I'm incredibly grateful to get to learn from this case and hope that we can all um, uh, you know take this reflective eye to the ways in which our illness scripts may reflect true reality at times, but also may reflect bias and stigma that may be perpetuated through um, through these reasoning tools as well. And I think the latter was certainly the case for me today, but also a great opportunity to get to unwind it as well. All right, I am finally done talking and I will now turn it over to you, Sammy, for the teaching points for today. All right, thank you so much, uh, Madalena, for jumping in and presenting this great case. And Jack, we are always are all so, so, so in awe when you discuss a case. And also thank you so much for that reflection at the end. I think it's so important to, to step back after the case and think, what could I have, I have done better and what do I want to take away from that? Um, so yeah, I'll just go over some quick teaching points. Um, we approach chest pain. We, we, there we have the four plus two mnemonic, which is four cardiac, two um, of which are two A's and two T's. The two A's are ACS and aortic dissection. And the two T's are tamponide and takatsugos. Then we have two pulmonary, which includes pneumothorax and PE. And then two esophageal, which include um, esophageal um, rupture and impaction. Clues um, when approaching a patient with chest pain is are, is it exertional or released by rest or nitro, or is it progressive? And is it progressive, which would point us more toward a towards a coronary artery insufficiency? Is it pleuritic, which would point us more towards the chest wall, the mediast mediastinum, and abdominal organs? And then we talked about the patient, a young patient with coronary artery disease, where we always have to consider causes of premature atherosclerosis, always check the family history and also systemic diseases that predispose to thrombophilia. Then we had this uncommon finding of left, left upper quadrant pain, which made us think about the spleen, the kidneys, which are generally, generally associated with back pain, splenic colonic flexure, from today on also stomach <laughs> and thoracic organ pathologies. Um, which would, for example, include lower lobe pneumonia, PE, MP, empyema, but also think about other intra-abdominal pathologies. Everything is so crowded in the abdomen, so you can really have every organ referring to everywhere. And then we, Jack taught us a general approach to anemia, which includes um, blood loss, hemolysis, and bone marrow failure, failure. Clues would be, for example, the time course, if it happens acute, Makes it would make us prioritize um, blood loss or hemolysis over bone marrow pathology. If it's more of a chronic anemia, bone marrow steps into the spotlight and can be, for example, due to nutritional deficiencies, stem cell disorders, and also myelophthesis. Other things you should always check are the MCV and the reticulocyte count because they point you into, into the different directions of anemia. Then Jack taught us. A little bit about large gastric folds, which can be seen in many Trier's disease, H. pylori gastritis, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, and also other rarer things like Sodding and Ellison syndromes, lymphoma, gastric carcinoma, sarcoidosis. Then he also taught us about a general approach to masses, which can be grouped as benign, which usually end with an OMA, <laughs> malignant, infectious, and also autoimmune um, causes, for example, sarcoidosis or GPA, but also many others. And when we approach a stomach mass, we should think about malignancy, which is my reflex thought, thought at least, um, carcinoma, but also think about neuroendocrine tumors, lymphomas, and also metastasis to the stomach, which of course are rare. And also think about non-malignant causes, for example, sarcoidosis, GPA, polyarthritis, nodosa, um, infections, for example, tuberculosis, fungi, or filamentous bacteria. So thank you all so much for spending that and time with us and I think we all learned so much today and I hope you all have a great afternoon or morning or evening whatever <laughs> awesome thank you so much Sammy those were epic teaching points and as everyone logs off I just want to give one big thank you and a round of applause to Amanda for your first time scribing thank you so much that was an absolute phenomenal job and uh, again thanks everybody for giving for volunteering your time today um, uh, and one final thank you to you, Madalena, for bringing just this awesome, awesome educational case. This was a blast, and we'll see you all next Wednesday for what I promise will be a shorter, actual 30-minute BMR. Um, but yeah, see you all later, and uh, uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you all so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>